Why does God care who I sleep with? Why does he have a say in who I sleep with? Why does God hate gays and lesbians and trans people? Why aren't you, George, affirming? Why aren't you like the Anglican Church of Canada and the United Church of Canada and the Presbyterian Church of Canada and Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada? Why aren't you affirming? What gets with that? I thought God was a God of love, a God of unconditional love. You don't seem to believe in unconditional love. How come you don't believe in unconditional love? Don't you think you should love unconditionally? But let me tell you, George, when I hear what Christians think, I don't think you guys love unconditionally. I think you hate gays and lesbians and trans people. Don't you think that your Bible's teaching condemns gays and lesbians and trans people to a loveless, lonely life? These are very common questions, and they're very good questions. And the fact of the matter is, whether or not we've ever been asked one of these questions directly ourselves, we're very conscious that this is how much of the world thinks about these matters. And we feel the full emotional and intellectual weight behind them. And we know that if we were to get asked this question in our workplace, in our neighborhood, and that there were others around, that the person who asked us this question, everybody else would be on their side. And if I had to answer those questions, I would be all by myself. So you know, it's an awful lot easier just to be silent. It's a lot easier to be silent because good grief, what would happen if it came up in a conversation at my workplace or at the hockey rink or the soccer field if the other dads or the other moms found out? And what about the fact that my coworker is a gay or a lesbian or his or her kids are? And you know that you can't really say much about it because they're just going to get emotional and it's not an academic argument and um, it's hard to know what to do. And so it's easier just to say nothing. But the fact of the matter is that even as we say nothing, the intellectual and emotional force and the social pressure of these things starts to bleed away something about what it means to be a Christian. We know that if we were to say something to try to defend Jesus or the Bible, we would instantly be viewed as a bad guy. And none of us like being the bad guy. And not bad guy in a cool way, like in a cool Hollywood movie where the bad guys can be cool, like loser bad guy like hopeless loser, bad guy. So I'm going to begin by sharing some really, really good news. And the really, really good news is this. The Bible has a very, very clear and consistent message that all sexual knowing and stimulation outside of the marriage of a biological male to a biological female is sin. And part of that really good news is that this is taught not only very specifically in clear Bible passages, the contrary is never taught. It's completely consistent with all of the other biblical doctrines about what it means to be human, the very nature of God. It is uh, consistent at the, the level of imagery and the deep structure of the Bible. And it is so completely and thoroughly taught in the Bible that, in fact, our gay and lesbian friends would say that the Bible is inextricably, unfixably heterosexist. Aren't you glad that I gave you that good news? <laughs> Maybe some of you were hoping, I said, well, you know, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, there's this nuance. No. So some of you are saying, well, <laughs> George, that's not good news. That's bad news. I was hoping there's going to be a lot of wiggle room in the Bible. 
So I'm not saying that it's easy to believe and hold that in Canada. In fact, I know how hard it is. My ministry space is in the gay village. And I spend a lot of times in coffee shops. And it's hard to be in a coffee shop where at least one person in the shift isn't gay or lesbian or trans. And I try to meet them and befriend them. And I'm not just going to talk about... Remember, my definition was it's not just about gays and lesbians and trans, right? The Bible very clearly teaches that any sexual knowing or sexual stimulation outside of the marriage of one biological male to one biological female is sin. And I stand before you as a redeemed sinner. That I stand before you as one who is sexually fallen. And I speak to a room of people who are sexually fallen. There is no sexually unfallen human being on the planet. There's only been one, and he loved you so much he died on the cross. But, you know, if you think about it, one of the things, if you wanted to, ins there's several ways you could insult a Canadian. If you told a Canadian that they had no sense of humor, they'd probably be insulted, even if they do have no sense of humor. When I'm giving advice about how to do a little talk after a wedding, I say, unless you're unbelievably funny, or you're as cute as a six-year-old boy or girl, be brief. And then I say, and virtually none of you are as funny as you think you are. <laughs> so be brief. And they'll all think it was the best speech they've heard in a wedding or after a in a funeral in their entire lives because it's brief. Another way to insult a Canadian is to say that they're thoughtless, that they don't think about things. We want to be thoughtful. And the fact of the matter is, is that if we actually think together and we walk towards these problems, and if we think together about them, we see that there's good reasons inside and outside of the Bible to believe that what the Bible teaches is actually very wise and very sane. In fact, it's an outline of sanity. It's an outline of wisdom. It's an outline of healing. It's an outline of restoration. That in fact, there's a mystery of life, and in this mystery of life, as you start to think deeply about human experience in light of the Bible and in light of the gospel, you start to realize that there's no better answer to the mystery of life and some of the mysteries of our experience. There is no better answer to the longings and yearnings of our heart than is found in the Bible. That in fact, it's almost as if when you talk about human experience and human longings and human insights, and you start to actually put them together, you realize that there's this, it creates this particular unique shape and nothing other than the gospel understood biblically and the Bible understood in light of the gospel fits that lock. Well, what do you mean? Well, here's this, because you might doubt it. Do you care who your sister or your mom sleeps with? or your best friend. If you find out that your best friend is sleeping with somebody, do you have any thoughts about that? Doesn't every single Canadian have thoughts and opinions about if they were to discover that their sister or their mom was sleeping with somebody? Don't you actually almost instantly, I mean, not always, but you'll often say, that's not right. Like, they shouldn't get involved with that person. Like, that person's going to be really bad for them. Isn't it like just a common, in fact, it's so common, it's a common thing. You can, it's common in movies, it's common in books. We automatically think that if a person is sleeping with another person, that sometimes that's a very, very, going to be a very, very bad thing for them. We have opinions about it. In fact, we'd say that if, if you discovered that you had a friend who had a friend, and you found out about who they were sleeping with, and then you realize that your friend didn't warn them or say anything about them, you'd say, don't you care about your friend? Like, what's going on with that? Well, if you care about who your sister or your best friend sleeps with, believe it or not, you're on the gospel and Christian side of the debate, not the non-Christian side. And the fact of the matter is, if you can have an opinion about who your sister sleeps with, why can't the triune God Like, why is it all right for you to have an opinion 
but not for God. Like That doesn't make any sense, does it? But some of you might say, okay, George, yeah, 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 we have opinions about that type of stuff, but that's, you're drawing lines in the sand. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the Can average Canadian's lines in the sand are going to be very, very different than, than yours, and, and yours are narrow and exclusive and hurtful, and, and Canadian's ones will be far different. It's just a line in the sand. Well, is it? Is it? I think if you think about different instances of those of you who have friends and you've found out that they're sleeping with somebody and I think in many cases you'd say that it wasn't just a line in the sand but it was a recognition of something that was real. I'll give you another example, a little bit different. Do you think your body is more like a temple or a playground? Now some of you realize with the force of the question that you can't say temple because I can not that I would do it, I'd say, gotcha. I wouldn't do it. So you say, playground. I say, really? So if your sister was working in a restaurant and the owner kept patting her on her bum and the owners were touching her on somewhere higher up, would you say that's completely and utterly fine because the body's just a playground? Don't you think she's not just crossed a line, they've crossed a line it's not that your line's different than theirs, but that there's a recognition that there's something fundamentally wrong about that? You do, don't you? In fact, if you think that the body is just a playground, not a temple, have you ever heard of the Me Too movement? If you think the body is more like a temple than a playground, you're on the Christian side of the discussion. And you're recognizing that it's not just a line, but that there's a real division. And you're all of a sudden, you're on the same side as the Christians on this issue, as the Bible. Do you think that sexual knowing is just another bodily function, like burping? Or is it special? We all know that you think it's special. Because if you were dating a young man or a young woman and they slept with somebody else, you wouldn't treat it the same way as if they burped. And if you think that sexual knowing is not just another bodily function but special, you're on the Christian side of this conversation. Do you think that sexual knowing is merely animal? Like a, two dogs rutting? Or is it special? Does it have meaning? If you think it has meaning, you're on the Christian side of the discussion. You're on the biblical side of the discussion. Do you think sexual knowing is absolutely essential to human flourishing? And here most Canadians would say yes. Then you can say, well, if it's essential to human flourishing, what about the elderly? Are you saying they can't flourish? What about people who are handicapped? Because of their handicap, we'll never know sexual knowing. Are you saying that their lives can never flourish? They can never have meaning or significance? Let's be very frank. What about people who are just very unlovely? What about young children? What about people who just for a variety of reasons were never able to marry? Are you saying that all of their lives are completely and utterly without flourishing and meaning, that they can't flourish? If you realize and recognize that you can't condemn the handicapped or the mentally ill to a life of no value or flourishing, if you think that's wrong, you're on the Christian side of the discussion. What about medical procedures? If you were to discover that your next door neighbor just casually said that their mom went in to have a doctor, and the next thing you know, the doctor just said they have to have unbelievably take these very, very powerful drugs and then undergo powerful surgery, and you just don't care about it. Wouldn't you look at them funny and say, really, just after one visit, you think they should go and have all of these things? Like, don't you think there should be a little tiny bit of a time? Like, is their life threatened? Like, are they going to die in the next second? Not going to die in the next second. Well, like, don't you think there should be a timeout? Like, don't you think there should be maybe a second opinion? Like, don't you think it's just not right to just let, like, don't you care about your mom or your sister or whatever? That you're just, they're just gonna, 
You're going to let them cut them open or take these powerful drugs? No. If you think there's something wrong about that, you're on the Christian side of the discussion. I'm a child of Irish immigrants. My wife is the... Uh, my wife is the daughter of a Polish immigrant and a Ukrainian immigrant. If one of my children claimed that they were African American, would you think they were wrong? If one of them claimed that they were First Nations and were getting discounts and getting a job to teach as an expert on being First Nation, would you think they were wrong? Well, why are they wrong? If you think they're wrong, you're on the Christian side of the discussion. Do you think you should learn to live in harmony with your body? Do you think it's good to learn Tai Chi or balance or other types of things because you want to be in harmony with your body? Do you think there's just something good about that? You're on the Christian side of the discussion. Do you think love is real and deep and important? Do you think love is maybe one of the most absolutely important things there ever has been and ever could be? Then you're on the Christian side of the discussion. Do you think that despite all appearances, and it looks to appearances as if death is stronger than love and death is stronger than life, Dang it all, you know you have this powerful intuition that love must be stronger than death, that love and life must be stronger, that death cannot really truly be the final word about human experience and human life, that there really life has to be stronger than death and love has to be stronger than death, and it's a very powerful intuition. If you think that, you are on the Christian side of the discussion. See, it's only when you start to actually think about this. And how do you draw the line? And how do you try to balance love and these different illustrations that you use? You know what? When you start to actually think about it, you realize that it's only the only, the only thing which fits into those things and brings not just a balance, but beauty and coherence and wisdom and sanity is the gospel understood in light of the Bible, the Bible understood in light of the gospel. Nothing fits that key. Nothing fits that shape. No other ideology, no other religion, no other spirituality will fit and bring coherence to that. See, the fact of the matter is, is that we Christians believe that love walked in history. Love walked in history. And he didn't walk amongst us untouched by the mess of our lives, but he lived amongst us in all our mess. He was known as Emmanuel. And he died on a cross in a spring day in the year 30 or the year 33 and on the third day, and his his death is one of the most well-known facts in history. It's reported by Jewish and by pagan historians. And three days after he died upon the cross, the grave was empty in history. The body was never found in history. And in history, he appeared alive to many, many, many people. And only the Christian account, not only is it that Jesus was love that walked amongst us, but only the Christian account can really really get at the deep, the deep reality of love. To our Muslim friends, we love you, but why did Allah have to create? How could Allah be love if there was no one to love? To our Buddhist and Christian friends, we love you. I mean, our Buddhist and Hindu friends, we love you. 
But if, if God is just all, you need an, an other to love. We Christians believe that from all eternity, before there was time, the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father. And the Holy Spirit was the very love that flowed between the Father and the Son from all eternity. And it was out of a fullness of love that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created human beings in his own image. He didn't create human beings because he needed slaves or he needed food or they, he, needed, he needed someone to love or he had, God was truly love. Only the Christian God explains that God is love. Only the Christian God. It was out of love for us that seeing our brokenness and our rebellion that he died on the cross for us. And the beauty and the coherence and the wisdom and the sanity and the power of the gospel, it's not just at this, these profound truths of love entering history and dying and, and the Trinity, but the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how broken you are, and I stand before you as a sexually broken man, as a fallen man, a man whose sexuality is not perfect, who needs the gospel, and to deal with the things in my life that I have to deal with, and for the lowliest Christian, there is a presence and a power that is not just mere words. Because when you put your hands in the hands of Jesus, he enters in and the Holy Spirit enters in. Friends, we are so grateful that you are here. And one of the things that we hope over the next few days is what I've just tried to outline in a very brief way will be unpacked by far wiser people than me. We're going to have Christopher Juan, whom I'll invent in a moment, and he'll open the Bible. And we'll have Christopher and others share their experience. And we'll have Andre explain what actually the real created world is like so that you understand what really goes on in these things. And out of understanding both the Bible and the science, you will be more confident in the Bible and you will be more desirous to love your neighbor for the good of the city. And we have Jojo to help us to figure out how to talk to people. And that's what's gonna happen over the next day or two and we hope you ask your questions. Just in closing, one passage of scripture. This is Jesus, he speaks it before he died upon the cross, but now we know he speaks across the ages to every single one of us who are here. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The yoke of Jesus as he walks with you is a yoke that restores you to sanity, will make you free, will make you whole, will fit you to love and to receive love. And I commend him to you.